I mean, it is unique. <laughs> I, as is, oh, I can't even believe you actually went with that. I was wondering if you would actually go with that picture. Do they not look like they go together perfectly? Kind of. I mean, just, they just do. Kind of. It's the magic of Disney Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Everyone, welcome to the Noobcast podcast for the 27th of October. Uh, this week, we've been joined by a hungry hippo. No, Not no. to be confused with, with hippodonymous. Hippo. Yep, exactly. No, uh, we, we had a guest that we were trying to line up. Uh, because of conflicting schedules, we had to put it off for a short time. So uh, it's just going to be the three of us. Uh, I got myself, the unabridged gamer, and Dizzy. We'll just going to talk a little bit about the news and other stuff. And then, yeah, that's the run of the show. That's what we're going to do. And I suppose we that, that's mind. what we usually do that's if we don't get derailed. <laughs> if we don't. Have you watched our show before? <laughs> have you watched our show before? If you haven't, welcome. <laughs> and also, you have every reason to be worried. Because <laughs> we will get re- derailed. Oh, goodness. I mean, you got a lot of stuff that we talk about that, that's actual news. But if we put that into a core, I feel like we would miss the heart of the experience, really. <laughs> kind of. Kind of, maybe, sort of. I don't know. <laughs> uh, jury's still out on that one. Yeah, probably. It's gonna uh, be a hung. It's gonna be a hung jury, I suspect. Um, well, it sounds more jury rigged. Uh, that said, yes, yes, I managed to diddly and make a terrible pun, and we are not even ten minutes in. I'm sorry, everyone. He's not he sorry. He hates and loves the podcast much as he hates and loves himself. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Uh, shall we just go ahead and go around and do our usual here? We'll start with uh, Mr. Unabridged Gamer himself, Elijah. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hello. I am doing very tired. That is how <laughs> I do. You don't say. Now, we don't have any visuals, but I can imagine circles under your eyes right now. <laughs> right. That, that, that would be a theme. Yes, yes. Um, there has been... Uh, if you have been following, you will have noticed that there's been a lot of things being made, and also me constantly rambling about how Disco Elysium has no end in sight. So, um, yeah. Yeah, lot, lots of things. But um, as to what I have been playing, I had a stunning experience. Oh, with, really? Um, with a game that starts out actually quite decent, and then falls apart all but literally in your hands oh go um, on um are you talking about the nintendo lab because no. if you had cardboard and you got it wet it would literally tear apart in your hands no but this digitally falls apart like uh just to give you a frame of reference here yeah it was possible for me to get outside of the skybox in one of the penultimate levels just by walking a straight line it was a rough experience, and uh, it was none other than Lego Star Wars 2 for the DS. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's a weird thing, but just, like, I need... Like, I've, like I said, I've been making a lot of videos for YouTube, and in between that, it's like, I need something to do, and I can't use my computer, so it's like, okay, this is inconsequential. I'm not going to have anything to say about this. And it's like, mm-hmm. at first, it actually fixes a lot of issues that LEGO Star Wars 2, the main version, has. Because, like, the main version, it's a masochistic nightmare at points. Like, they just throw so many enemies constantly spawning at you that you've got no chance in hell of ever surviving. It's really weirdly mean-spirited the main console game at points. The Death Star levels are just... Whoever thought that that was fine enough for kids is insane. And yet this one fixes all of that and then as soon as you leave A New Hope everything goes downhill. Dagobah never even happens in The Empire Strikes Back. Han Solo just magically gets frozen in carbonite. We never actually see it 
it just jumps immediately to you landed on Bespin. Now you're with Lando. Where's Han? Who cares? Let's go. And it just it it gets so bad that in the final level when you're fighting Palpatine, I finished it in under two minutes because it was just that broken. And it starts off with you just basically ground pounding Palpatine over and over again while he's got a mob of like close to eight bodyguards just running around like headless Roombas. And then the final part is just playing as Vader. Luke does nothing, and Vader just keeps dragging Palpatine down into an electricity thing that apparently Palpatine has like this fitness electricity thing that just spins round and round on the floor. Why is this here? What is this? I have no idea. But you're literally just pulling down a bunch <laughs> of times, and then it's done. And then it's over. Oh, and also when you're flying the Millennium Falcon out of the Death Star, um, parts of the Death Star vanish before they're even out of view. Like whole set, and it's not like they're exploding because even before you blow anything up, sections are just vanishing. There's a section where you pilot an ATST, and the DS version has this cute idea where you can put cosmetics on characters whenever you want. The default is a ball cap. When you put the ball cap on the ATST, it goes on its knee. Hmm. It was an experience, to be sure. I The thing that scares me is, whoever had this cart before got 60% of everything unlocked in it. Like, they, they spent a substantial amount of time with this train wreck, and it's like, even me, the guy who played Blood Knights, looks at this and goes, yeah, I don't want to do that again. I, I had enough. So whoever this person was has way too much patience. They must be, you know, going for sainthood. It just gets insane. But um, on the positive side of things, like I said, Disco Elysium, really good. Really, really good. I highly recommend it. The hype is for real. The one companion you have in the game, Kim, is so fully realized he feels like an actual person. Mm hmm a lot of the writing is amazing. And uh, how was I said? I played it to one friend. I was explaining just one simple intersecting set of quest lines, okay? Okay, so at one point, I impersonated as a psychic to get past a bookshop's curtain to stuff a hanged man's body in a giant taxidermy bear freezer so that child drug addicts would stop pelting the body with stones, making it illegible for evidence. This is an early quest. I have spent nearly as many hours playing this game as there are in uh, in, a, in the first in game just in the first in game game as I would if spending an actual day in the life doing things. It is dense. It is amazingly well written, and I love that in an RPG where there is basically no combat. Like the first time I lost health was because I sat on a crappy chair. <laughs> Wait. Which, in fairness, does happen. Oh yes! Oh, it's, that's just, it's intentional. It's just, it's like if you fail the skill check for you know how good your body is. And the thing is, I built my character to be very high on charisma, very high on intellect, and he literally has one hit point. The only reason that one hit point doesn't get wiped out in a second is that I also got a stat that increases endurance. So he basically takes two thirds of whatever would be a single hit. Mm -hmm. So he barely survives. He's mostly dead, but still slightly alive. <laughs> the classic West canon. Yes. It just, the, fact, I, I, the fact that a chair could bring you... I assume at that point, that chair nearly killed you. Yes, I you actually had to use a health item. You would, you would hope that would do it, I guess. <laughs> it, it, what it caused... Uh, it creates an issue with posture, and then it's a lifelong issue that actually makes that point even less than a point. Clearly, that's how that works. Oh, yeah. It's just, but it's, <laughs> <a point. laughs> uh, it's really great stuff, and there's some amazing writing for incredibly minute details, like just that bookshop that I got behind. Mm -hmm. The woman thinks it's cursed. The reality is... You just learn, like, you know, close to over a dozen stories of failed businesses that try to do so many different things. And there's even one with a role-playing game company that was played via radio transmissions that there's a chance that you could actually unlock some sort of secret from them, but you have to find the password that the former CEO left behind. And 
you have to figure out a way to contact him because he's made millions since he's moved on but the entire office space is just left in complete decay it's stunning and you learn all this by this woman who just makes hobbyist dice and who sits up at the top of the smokestack you know just casually ignoring the rest of the world this is one minute sector of everything there is a story behind pretty much every step the level of nuance on display is fantastic remember I was touting how Vampire was one of the best written games of its day. Disco Elysium outpaces it drastically. I wouldn't say like it's going to be as accessible as Vampire was. There's definitely going to be a type of gamer who's going to be bored with Disco Elysium because there is a lot of reading. There is some voice acting and it's freaking amazing, but um a lot of it is reading and you know making sure you're doing the right sort of analysis. So if you're not looking for a game that's highly in your head, or if you're looking for a game that you can play just hours and hours on end, then Disco Elysium isn't for you. Like, literally, I start to get a headache if I play it for, like, longer than three hours because there's just so much thinking you have to do, which is great. We don't get games like this. Mm -hmm. But also, it's going to be a hard sell for certain people, but if you at all sound interested, yes, it is worth a look. It is got the spirit of an independent game, absolutely fantastic you will laugh every single minute and yes intentionally choose some of the silly options because oh my gosh do they let you basically act like the lead character from psych sometimes in the best way possible well then that's partly what's been keeping you busy i'm guessing partly the other part is um basically been making lots and 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 lots of YouTube. I am sneezing videos. You you can't see it right now because there's no camera. That's why it's 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 ugly. There's like MP4s falling out of my face right now. Yeah, that sounds uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, that that right there, that was a hyperlink that just came out. And if you look over here, I have a pile of MP floors for just the audio and then there's gonna be another one that's gonna be for the video i mean to be fair i've been getting to cover some stuff that i've wanted to for a while i got to talk about a game from my teen early teens back when i first got a ps3 that i wanted to talk about for ages that weirdly got bad handed i still don't understand what the hell people were on about it was really an interesting little gem but um yeah i also just I look forward to when sleep is, you know, a normal thing again. But sleep is nice. What? No, 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 no. You don't, you, don't, you don't get to sleep? What do you think this is? That's sleep. not how this works. I, I want sleep. I want sleep. No, that's not how this give works. Give me the sleeps. Nope. You'll give me the sleeps. Also, I'm just putting this out as a warning to everyone. I have the Force Unleashed on DS, and I know how to use it. You have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> you can give me that look all you want. You can give me that look all you want. Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, I'm giving you that look. You know oh, what? I see. Don't, don't you worry about that. That's happening. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, there oh, actually, actually is one th extra thing I should say about the DS in experiencing okay. the 2DS XL. Um... One, this downloading system Nintendo opted for with the unwrapping packages and everything, it's really cute the first time. It's really not cute the 20th time. <laughs> and, um, uh -huh. can I just say, Ironfall. Really impressive that it was made by two people and it is a full Gears of War clone that works on the 2DS so well. It's a stunning achievement. Neither of these gentlemen were writers. Oh, good gravy, are they not writers? Go on. Just, if you ever need a laugh, just watch the opening cutscene to Ironfall, and you will be laughing aplenty. Because it is... I mean, I, I've talked about... It makes Blood Knights look like a Bioware game. Okay. It is that badly written. Like, it's Pretty actually sure fun, but um, not well written. So, um... Bear that in mind. <laughs> Noted. Okay. And that's on the list of things that I will avoid for an indeterminate amount of time. Well, it's not like the rest of us don't have incredibly large backlogs or anything. 
Is that uh, oh, everything goodness. that you've been uh, playing then? Oh yeah, I've right, mostly right. just been trying to get through Disco Elysium for work. It's just like, this game has an end. I know it has an end. It's coming. Mm. At some point, some point I will solve this murder. I know who the general suspects are. I have a few suspicions, but I have to talk to another significant political figure, and there's a whole other district I still need to get to, despite having spent hours and hours and hours with this game. I've got to say, I, I find it really cool that you're engaging and, and actively thinking about it, even when you're not playing. I think that that's something that definitely sounds interesting and good. Oh, yeah, but it, it's marvelous. Even if you could get sleep, you would just have dreams of this game. You would just have dreams that you're you're investigating and finding additional information. I'm not sure if sleep is uh, a good idea for you. It, yeah, it's funny you say that because <laughs> seriously, the other day I actually had a dream where I was investigating something. I think it, this thing is having the same effect on me that Veronica Mars did, where my brain is just starting to be like, yeah, let's think about this. It's like, no, we have too many other things to think about already. Crazy brain. Crazy brain. Oh dear. It's okay. It's uh, okay. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Mm. Well, is that uh, is that everything We're, then, or is there I anything think else? We that covered you... everything. Oh, okay. Unless anyone has any questions, I think. <laughs> no, no uh, questions. No questions. We're fine. Well, uh, despite being sleep deprived, Elijah, welcome again to the show. <laughs> Pizza G, welcome. How are you doing? Hello, hello. I am doing all right. A little bit under the weather because, you know, it's about that time in the season where yep. things start getting that way. Yeah. But then enjoy enjoying it quite a bit. Good. Um, totally non-gaming related, but really fun. I was at a costume contest yesterday and, um, well, I can't say it's not gaming related because there were some amazing costumes. Um there was a Skull Kid in particular, and I've never seen Skull Kid done as well as it was. Oh, nice. So, uh, a <laughs> lot of great stuff. I was planning on making a big, elaborate costume, and then never figured out logistically how I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I went as Bob Ross. Turns out, not too bad. Did you, did you just make that little tree, that little bush or whatever right, right there to I, cover that? Did you do anything like that? I, I did. I did make a, a lot of friends and happy little trees <laughs> and, and clouds. And I think Excellent. there was a rock named Patrick at some point. <laughs> nice. It, nice. Was, it was a great time, and I, I'm glad so many people came to enjoy the experience. Nice. It, it, like, Bob Ross is the original ASMR. I'm not sure if anyone realizes that. <laughs> oh, God. But without a doubt, it is true. Like... You can listen to Bob Ross in the background while you are gaming for an hour straight, and you're just like, I know I was just fragging people that entire time, but I feel so chill right now. This is just great. Look at all of these happy little accidents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Nice. Yeah, so, as a matter of games I have yes. been playing, though, yes. um, I did wrap up Astral Chain, and I'm going to give nice. a couple of moments here for anybody who might be concerned about spoilers for Astral Chain. It's a new game. It recently came out, um, what was it, about a month ago. And so I want to make sure you got heads up if you're planning on getting it right now. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the synopsis. I think that overall as a game... Uh, very enjoyable. I enjoyed the combat elements of it. Same sort of stuff that I was talking about before. My big critique is that... Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that spoiler alert sitting there. My big critique is that there are so many different pieces of storyline that they start introducing and get you excited about, and they like the writers just get distracted by the next shiny that they've come up with. Mm-hmm. So, like, we don't really know the, like, we don't have a firm grasp as to why we are in the scenario that we are in this game to begin with, where these extraterrestrial creatures are coming from, why, what they're aiming for, things like that. It's just, can we defeat them or can we not defeat them? And I feel like there's a giant element to that. Um, you never really learn why, 
one of the uh, main antagonists decides to do things the way that she does, and there's a lot of reason to go and explore that, but it never happens. Um, the post-game says, oh yeah, everything's going good, and now we're doing expeditions to try to clear the rest of the world of all of this awful blight that we've been dealing with this entire time, mm -hmm. which makes absolutely no sense in the context of the game, and is primarily, my guess, an excuse to just have post-game element. Which is fine, but they could have also done it in a way that would build a universe. I, they don't it is my sincere opinion that they do not care as much about building the universe as much as it was just making a good game. And they did. Like, mechanically, it was fantastic. The plot, I, I did actually enjoy walking through, but it's the sort of situation where you have to... You have to relax a little bit and just enjoy the experience. It's, it's a ride. It's not a novel. Like, okay. it's not something that you're really supposed to explore past entertainment value, which is a little unfortunate. Yeah, I can see where that something like that would be um, a letdown, I suppose. So, <clears throat> um, overall, uh, it sounds like you kind of pretty much enjoyed the game, though. Yeah, I mean, overall, I will definitely say it's satisfying. I don't regret my purchase, getting it immediately. I think if I had known a little bit more as to how it was going to turn out, I might not have gotten it immediately. I might have waited a little bit of time, but it's not a dissatisfaction that I decided to play it, and I was happy to be one of the first to do it. Okay. Nice. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else will be important for you. I would wait... I would wait out if you're not like a huge um, action fan. Like if you're if you're not like I'm gonna go get the next DMC the moment it comes out. I would probably wait until it's about forty bucks. But I think it's the sort of title that everyone can get a, a piece and enjoy. No mm. hmm. question though. What yes. I thought is because there's gonna be some people who you know play Nintendo games and they don't play a lot of action. You think mm -hmm. it'll be as an accessible entry point? Um, if you really like anime, then yes. Um, that is that is the one jump point where I'd be like, oh yeah, I could see you getting into it because of this. Okay, is that but that is it. Like the the storyline is is like a straight carbon copy, and it's like a, an anime with a story like a bad story arc. I won't even say that. But like a story arc where it's more that the action matters than the actual plot content. Interesting. But that being said, I mean, I've I've definitely I'm I'm willing to embarrass myself and say that I've watched more than enough shows like that. So Well, I'm glad you're honest about it at least. Mm. Uh so would you say that it's it the the whole if you're an anime fan it's like it's only major selling point if anyone's kind of uh on the edge of getting it or what what other points would be a reason to, to look at uh at Astro pain it is a very unique combat element controlling two characters at the same time and doing so in a way that feels fluid is difficult to perform and i definitely will say astral chain does that very well mm -hmm. It's definitely an attractive element. It's a definitely a unique element. That you, I mean, I've played a handful of games that do that seamlessly and simultaneously in a way that is of interest. Most of them fail on that. Okay. Good, Good deal. What else have you been playing? Uh, to be honest with you, not too much. I've been continuing to keep up with Slay the Spire and play around with the beta. I just realized that I've clocked uh, about 400 hours in the game. Okay. Which is starting to get into, like, MMO territory. This is yep. a weird thing for me, especially for a game that is just a one-time purchase. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder why I haven't tried more of these one-time purchase games versus subscriptions when I was, you know, interested in doing something for that extended amount of time. I've, I've surprisingly found myself in a time sink without expecting it. I I think I know what that's like a little bit, those time sinks. Just a, just a hair, yeah. Slay the Spy, though, yeah. Interesting. 
Yeah, I, I think the most interesting element of it is that in a lot of time sync games, it's, hey, I'm going to get 120 of a certain item, and then I'm going to have the item that I want, and now I'm going to find the next thing that I want to do, or maybe I'm going to take it over to raiding, and I'm going to spend four hours every week trying to defeat this boss time and time again until we eventually do it. And the thing with Slay the Spire is that there's always a new thing that you can do with the game, mm -hmm. I feel. Mm -hmm. And some MMOs, I think, really capture that. But nothing has done it in a way that, like, strategy is so incredibly important as it is in Slay the Spire because it is a card game. And so, I, I don't know, it just strikes me very differently in a way that I, I haven't enjoyed for a long time. Okay. Well, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, uh, having those types of things and uh, uh, what is it... Uh, what is it about the the card game style that makes you come back to it? I, I'm 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 just asking because when we get around to mine, I've also got a card game in my recent plays. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear what it is about this particular card game that draws you back in and keeps you playing. I think that with this card game, I mean it's it's all about decision making. Okay. At the end of the day, for me, and with cards, you have very distinct decisions that you are making. Mm -hmm. Um, that aren't uh, necessarily timed. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think about something like Astral Chain. Yes, there are a lot of decisions that are being made moment to moment while you're in combat, but it feels different because it's fluid in motion and you have the same sort of actions all the time. Whereas in a game like Slay the Spire or a lot of other card games, like you're, you're looking at a very unique situation that you handle very differently one way versus the other. Where, where sometimes you have to particularly play defensive or pull a completely different strategy than what you normally would do in order to defeat an opponent. That rarely happens in, like, in fighting games, I think. And as a result, uh, has a lot more appeal to me. Okay. No, that's fair. Yeah, that makes sense. I was, I, again, I was just curious because, uh, again, I, one of my games will be a card game, too, so... You know, I had to hear that. Uh, what? Uh, so, Slate Inspire, Astro Chain, those have been your games then? Those have been. Oh. I played a tiny little bit of Darkest Dungeon, and I erased my save files, apparently, which is oh, sad, because no. I had like, I had like 10, 15 hours of stuff back there. Uh, it is nice whenever you have a roguelike to kind of go back and retrace your steps and mm -hmm. do the sort of things that now that you look back, you think, oh, yeah, I should have prepared X, Y, Z way instead of what I was thinking when I first came in. Mm -hmm. So I do like that a little bit, but um, I still need to find the time to recover all of that, which was was a lot of time. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, God, losing... Uh, was it just a new machine and something didn't carry over from Steam Cloud? Uh, that's... Probably what happened, but yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, that's probably what happened then. God, that sucks. Ten to fifteen hours. I wonder if it would still be on your old machine then, somewhere in like uh, C oh, yeah. profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off, uh, Steam Cloud. Turn off Steam Cloud Sync so it doesn't wipe it out for you when you first boot it up. Then you should be able to get the files back. There you go. I mean, so so here's the real dilemma. Could I realistically do that? Yes. Do I want to do it now that I've started things out a little bit and I do like the idea of correcting previous mistakes that I've made? Mm, not so much. It would be cool to make like a straight on comparison like, hey, I'm at the same week in the game. Where am I at now that I kind of know what's going on versus the first playthrough? That's fair. No, that's <laughs> fair. That makes sense, I guess. Just ideas of ways to try to recover files because that's a thing too. So. It's true. Yeah. Well, and it's a lot easier on PC, um, and with cloud services, some stuff works really well, some stuff doesn't. It's still better than, you know, back in the original PlayStation era. You had that memory card break on you. You're screwed, yeah. Yeah. And oh. it wasn't just one game. Oh, your memory card all... corrupt? Too bad. <laughs> yeah. All 15 of your files. Yeah. Not that you could have more than 15, but... Right. If you're lucky. <laughs> Oh, okay. my goodness. Okay. 
But yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the the beginning and end of it this week or the these last couple of weeks. What have you been up to, Mish? Uh, well, uh, I've been playing the being a guest on a podcast game. That was fun because uh, there was uh, there was some change over on who was hosting it, and then things got canceled and rescheduled and whatnot. And finally made that appearance yesterday, where I talked about myself. It was weird. I don't like talking about myself. That was odd. Yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable because mm -hmm. you get into that spot where you're like, I'm not actually that interesting. I'm not sure if y'all know that, <laughs> but we see the, th the funny thing is, that so many content creators, you listen to them, it's like, God, they're so interesting. No, we're not. No, we're not. We just play up how well. Uh, just. We played up so we're not as boring as everyone else thinks we are. And I need to adjust that just a hair, I'm noticing. Um, yeah, no. So that was a thing. Uh, but beyond that, it's been it's been the same few games again. Uh, I've been... <laughs> so one of my games, card game, Magic the Gathering Arena. I went back and played more MDG Arena. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my character's now... Or my profile's now level 25. Uh, they are like you can't keep getting rewards this way. You have to go play different game modes. So I'm like, what? But but this is the fun part. Yeah, right? So I've been doing quite a bit of that. Um, playing The the pre-assembled decks that come with the, the game aren't that bad, honestly. Um, I'm I'm kind of impressed with that, actually. Hmm. What do you think drives that decision? Like, are, are they like competitive worthy games or, or decks, or is it just like? Uh, I think it's just how well the cards actually work with one another and the type of play style the cards the decks have uh, to go along with it. So, like, uh, one of the my main color is red. I play red decks. I love burn decks. I like, uh, mm. oh, you're taking two damage and three damage and two damage and three damage all at the same time, plus you're getting attacked by three creatures, and you're at half your health. How do you like so that? So you're at the goblin, or you're the goblin keeper. I, I don't, do, I don't do goblins. I believe oh. it or not, I don't do goblins. No, I don't do that okay. in my red decks. It's, it's, um, I, because before Arena, all the, the MTG games I'd play is Legacy, right? So mm. I'm talking old school burn decks with, like, mana flare and doing the quick like uh shock lightning bolt um flare etc all these different like low ca mana cost uh uh quick burns and then i mm. come back at you and go oh there's a fire there's a, a red mana and then x and you just watch me tap and tap and tap and <laughs> tap and you're just like shit and all of a sudden i drop a fireball for 12 damage on you that was the type of way i played that was uh gotcha. yeah that was my type of tech and there's similar type <laughs> yeah i saw that um I, it, they don't have any of the like the big building burn spells but all the other stuff is there and it's made up with with creatures uh in in modern uh styles of ntg and i just really mm -hmm. kind of enjoyed that i also got a chance to play other stuff that i don't otherwise normally do like there was a zombie deck there was a counter spell uh almost there was a what spell Zombie deck. Get your oh, head. and a counter spell. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's counter not spell like deck. you said a very different kind of spell, and it was no, like, wait, counter what? Counter spell deck. Okay. Yeah, blues All use right, your counter good. spells and unsummons and such. Hey, hey, I'm just making sure. And just to make it clear, that's that's not adding counters. That's not having a counter top suddenly spring up out of nowhere that that is that is counteracting other magics you yeah. know i don't believe magic so you know it's not a reason for me to for there to just be you know suddenly and now you're really amazed and doing home improvement oh my gosh that that is that is the counter mage that we all actually need in our lives yeah right oh my goodness uh yeah doing that um or or like an elf deck that has a lot of mana abilities with it and it was great to actually play those and actually experiment with those various colors and play decks that i wouldn't normally do and actually enjoy playing them is there any deck that you still would completely avoid like is there a color that's like your your least favorite color white Cuse. white decks <laughs> 
Don't like white decks. <laughs> I, they they don't have Puce on a bridge gamer. I'm sorry to say, like Puce is that, not a Magic the Gathering color. You know, there is the problem right there. That's why. There you go. Anyway, you were saying what? But no, you said that's your least favorite deck. You don't have to worry about Puce decks. It won't happen. Yeah, exactly. Just... Yeah, you have nothing to worry about. Everything's good. <laughs> Uh, but no, is it is it like a flying part? Not a fan of weenie decks. Uh, let's try that again because we just had a technical hiccup. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. All I got from there is weenie decks, and now I'm even more confused. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the only part you need to actually understand. <laughs> oh, well, that, well, that's good then because that is all I got. <laughs> Everything else was you going to Cybertron there, Optimus. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm going to need you to repeat your last question. Yes. Oh, what is it about white decks that's that's the challenge? Is it the flyers? Is it the... Uh, I think it's a lot of the white tokens that come from various things. Uh, so you cast a knight or something and it gives you the t additional tokens and it builds those up and i really don't care for that i recall at one time you used to have a griffin deck a griffin angels deck which i thought was okay uh in legacy mm -hmm. but uh it's just not my cup of tea um if i was going to do stuff like that i'd rather just go black and use rats and zombies and go the same route um usually because one of the big things i really enjoy is direct damage uh and which is why i play red and white doesn't have a lot of that direct damage that is entirely true mm -hmm. <laughs> although admittedly the other thing I, th I think i uh white with green i was able to uh beat someone down while knocking myself up to like 55 lives so that was fun see that's that's a <laughs> level of winning that's just like no no you haven't just lost You've lost, and I've become greater <laughs> as a result of this experience. Thank you. That That is particularly evil, which yeah. is strange given that it's a white deck. But it's a white deck. I should evil. actually be playing black and red and Sith. I don't know. <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure if she would go full on Sith, but I think she would deeply enjoy being a dark Jedi. Probably. Uh... <laughs> So, yeah, I've been playing a lot of Arena. Uh, of course, I've been doing my roleplay. Um, I've got some really active stories going on in our roleplay server right now. Conspiracies. Uh, there are conspiracies. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Uh, involving Ooh. the rest of a pretty notorious character and uh, the interactions with another group, criminal group, that... Uh, it's great when you have other players from the same criminal group watching in chat and they're just like, what the fuck just happened? It's like, oh, so you don't know this. Interesting. It's good when other <laughs> players in that group don't know what's going on and they're just as blindsided. You know it's good then. Uh, that's, that's beautiful. Yep. I have to ask about the conspiracy theories. Do any of them include the aliens that dropped you onto this alternate universe? Uh, oddly enough, there have not been any uh, alien conspiracy theories it's really interesting now that you mention it because i figured that huh. someone would have ran with that but now that you mention it no no one's brought it up that's <laughs> that's not happened i'm kind of surprised by it to be honest with you um oh, that needs to happen someone needs to make a character specifically to run around and say it's the alien well i mean so the event that we had what was it three weeks ago it was all aliens you know, I've I've shot three myself as a even before becoming a detective. Like I shot three. They're, well, they're not uncommon. That's just part of the effort. Entrance exams is how you <laughs> shot three aliens yet. Okay, right. you have. Well, now we know absolutely that you're ready to be an officer in Los Santos. Well, it's a uh, it's actually the the new name is Agent J. Um, I should be wearing a black suit, black tie. You're played by Will Smith. Ooh. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been doing that. Uh, it's it's been it's been good. The stories have been really good. Uh, the, and I honestly think that since I've joined and watching the RPers get that much better and the stories develop further, they have been so so good. And it's really interesting to see how something that was said that was obscure 
two months ago can be brought back up and all of a sudden that is a very important thing that was said that was very obscure two months ago. It's very, very intriguing, very deep and wow. I'm I'm loving it. I'm absolutely yeah. loving it. Man, everything's I mean, funny games, and then you've got a giant Cthulhu monster underneath a secret military base. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe. Don't don't give anyone anyone any ideas. They they might. Oh no, that actually happened to me once oh. in a, in, a, in a Star Wars role playing thing. Space Cthulhu happened as a thing, and I kid you not, it was an accident. It was not supposed to be a horror role playing thing, and it turned into one. Okay, nobody intends to summon the Eldritch Horror into any universe. Just saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really impressive, though, to have that level of depth in yeah. a story that no one person is actually writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm asking that for games where people have all the time in the world before it actually launches and it's not happening. And here you are in real time making that happen. That's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I think I'm glad to see more people experiencing it. Yeah, no, I think it's a great way to experience the, the game stories that exist out there. And uh, the fact that you have viewers that, um, that just continue to come back and watch. We have one viewer who she's our encyclopedia. Right, like she knows so much about what's going on. She's almost like the keeper of the stories because she knows so much of what's going on with them. But it's just because people are so intrigued and, and want to keep watching and see what happens with them. And of course, mm. uh, the rest of us are the same way too. If I'm not live doing it or RPing, I try to keep up with some of the, uh, especially other characters that uh, I interact with well a lot. I want to know what the go on is, even if my character doesn't know me as the player. I sure as hell do. Mm. Um. Yeah. How do you separate that out? Like when you know something because you've learned about it through somebody else out of character versus mm. in character. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question, and it's um, it's something that should be brought up in any type of RP, right? I I mentioned this in at our D and D session, and our our GM was just like, "Thank you." Uh, was um, how do I know this? How does how does Gene Hart know this? Or how does Lord of Song steal it, my D&D character? How do they know this? And if you can't explain it, that means that the player knows, not your character. Yeah. Right? If I can go, well, Gene knows this because she had that conversation with Liz at Pillbox about this situation where Liz mentioned this. Okay, then Gene knows. Gene knows that part of whatever it is, right? But if I can't do that, then it's me as the player that knows. Um, <clears throat> and you yeah. have to be pretty what quick on that. What is a specific event? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you have to do that all the time. Is how do how does how do I know that? How does my character know that? You have to ask that question all the time. And it's a great way to keep your not just yourself and your character separated, but other characters separated too. We have. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just drop his name. We have a uh, Mr. Gray, uh, who is a great RPer, and uh, he's got a couple characters, and they, the, their stories actually overlap to a degree. But he uses that same method. How does uh, Russell White know this versus how does uh, Zeo Kelvin know this? And he does that so well and on the fly so well, and there isn't any bleed from one character to the other to the player and vice versa. And it's a, it's a good practice, I think, that all of the various play if you're an RPer, that this is a practice that you should continue to try to do is how does my character know this it, it makes the story just interesting in general too because if your character if, even if you know something if you know that you if, that if you go through a door it's going to be absolute disaster but if your character doesn't know it go through the door oh absolutely plus no matter what is you're going to find the most interesting outcomes when you act purely in keeping with your character versus anything else because like with any good fiction, the best thing that comes from it is when you see characters making all of their own choices that they would make rather than what the plot demands or what the writer wants. That the, some of the best storytelling is just simply watching things play out. So even if everyone there knows precisely what's going to happen, if you just let the character dynamically flow, it can be mm -hmm. amazing like you're watching TV firsthand. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, especially well, if you got a good RPR too. But yes, please, Dizza. 
Exactly. It's being comfortable with bad things happening to a character that you spend time with. Mm -hmm. Is the other piece is that like that's that's a development piece to your character that they're going to have to deal with X Y Z thing. Could they be terribly injured? Yes. Could they die in the line of fire? Absolutely. But you know what? It's worth it because this is where they're at. This is their perspective on it, and they wouldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to find it because I don't know where it is right now. But I actually have a a D twenty um, that. I had on my desk is actually from Rob, who plays uh, Monica Rupert on our server, uh, and a couple mm -hmm. other characters. But at, at TwitchCon, he gave me a D20, and for stuff that I've been trying to decide on, that's been my deciding factor. If I'm not mm -hmm. sure, I'll just roll it quick. I, I have a uh, knowledge religion check to make. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of what it is. Um, I I did that with um the the and i i kind of stuck that stat but um a, a stat was where i was following someone that i had to talk to and i watched him go down this alleyway and uh i was at the spot where we we're going down the alley but um the buildings had narrowed in where he was and mm. he stopped and because of a check i'd done earlier um as soon as i saw him stop i'm like shit and like dove over to the side which would have been out of his view um as a character and then i doubled back and was able to catch up with him another way and he had, the, the character had no idea that i had done that now that said the player later on was like no i completely had to cam on you the entire time that was brilliant well done <laughs> um but that was a dice roll from earlier in the night Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, yeah, so I've been playing that. Uh, the only other thing I haven't played, or I've been playing, but it's not been on stream, is uh, I've been playing more, uh, what is it, Synth Riders. I've been playing a lot of Synth Riders again. Oh, yeah. There's now three of us competing with one another uh, on scores, and, uh, whew. What a, what a, what a experience that is to actually watch my score score get beat. I'm like, damn it, I've got to go back and beat it again. Um, especially since someone actually streams it. So, yeah, that's been a thing. Yeah, there is something to be said for that level of competition bringing you back in on something. It's mm -hmm. it's a lot of. Like, you see people doing that in speedrunning, where they're getting value out of games and literally playing games for thousands and thousands of hours because they want to have the top record in the world, they had it, and then somebody else came in and found a couple of ways to cut off a couple of seconds. Well, and that's definitely true with, like, speedrunning. In, in the case of, like, our, uh, of our, <laughs> with our competition, it's just a case of, uh, you know, hey, so uh, I saw that you're number, you were number seven on the scoreboard. Um, you're actually number eight now, saying hi to you from the number four spot on the, on the board. Let me, let me know when you catch up. You know, just stuff like that. And just small mm -hmm. little jabs at one another. But really, it's great because that actually becomes our motivator. And this is actually something I'm hoping to talk about in a couple weeks. By the way, spoilers, guys. A little bit of what's com possibly coming up on the show in the near future. But it's a motivator. It's a motivator. I'm on a Thursday. What was Wednesday or Thursday? Uh, no, it was Thursday. I, I burned 750 calories doing Sith Riders. On one day? All in one day. And I could have kept going. I had, no, you know what? It was Wednesday because it was uh, Crafty's birthday. I had to, I had to stop so I could go shower so we could go out to dinner. <laughs> um, yeah, I could have kept going. I could have easily gotten to about a thousand that day, which is just mind boggling to think like, wow, I could have burned a thousand calories that day. Holy shit. That's a lot of that's a lot of calorie. But the it's just it's that easy to keep going. And it's that whole you feel good after it. Like I was I, I felt the poop of, of doing the work, but man did I feel good after it and I can't wait to talk more about that feeling. Um 
I, I didn't realize that VR was also going to be, you know, an exercise utility. But uh -huh. when you put the value that way, uh huh, you know, it legitimizes how it expensive it Wii. is. So, it worked for the Wii. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah, absolutely. And this is just the next step. Um, and th like I said, this is just a small preview of something that we're going to come up. I don't want to go too much into this conversation because there's a lot to talk about in a couple weeks. But yeah, that's been a major thing I've been doing too. And uh, for the, a couple people that have mentioned it, yes, I'm trying to figure out how that content can actually be created. I'm trying to figure it out. I will figure out a way. I will. And that's Life. everything. <laughs> right. Kind of. Uh, part of that content creation is me cursing at the unabridged gamer going, why the hell does Vegas do this and not blah, blah, blah. He's been my sounding board the last few nights. <laughs> it's better than Brett Hair. It's better than Brett Hair. But anyway. I'm an Adobe snob. No way. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's everything there. Should we just dive into uh, one of our headlines off the get-go? I suppose we shall. Yes. Do we want to talk about uh, what ESPN leaked recently? Oh uh, well, uh, th there was some extra topic and discussion about that. So, um, are you are you ready for ranting? Uh, um, oh, that's what we came here for. That is kind of what we came here for. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So to bring everyone up to speed, in case you are unaware of what exactly it is we are talking about, ESPN has leaked information that there is an expected Overwatch 2 to be announced at BlizzCon this year. And there's imagery to it, there's a logo, uh, there's Blue mention... Show is confirmed coming back, which stunned no one. Mm -hmm. I was going to say. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, uh, that's a big thing. So... Elijah, you have thoughts. Why don't you go ahead and just kick it off with that right away? Because I would love to hear what it is. Um, until I see that they have stopped screwing over supports, I'm not interested. That is my Ooh. response to Overwatch 2. If they have figured out how to stop making it be a DPS-only game and they stop jamming in things like Team Deathmatch and Deathmatch, which are blatantly not things that Overwatch should have, then they might possibly vaguely get me to glance at it. Those well, are my thoughts. So, about that, one of the things that they're expecting from Overwatch 2 is a, PvP, a PvE mode. Mm -hmm. There is a PvE mode where as you progress through that, that particular mode, you unlock more of your character's abilities. That is... That... So, Battleborn. That they're is making good. Battleborn. I mean, wow. I can legitimize that, though. I know how many people have played Overwatch and said, I, I like this, but I really don't want to play against people all the time. Yep. Oh, yeah. But I, I guess the, the thing that confuses me is I feel like it's, we're going to put this feature behind a paywall rather than, like, we're actually making a new game. It's very much in the line of um, Call of Duty and other games that, that have annual purchases that you make for what is more or less the same game. And I'm I'm a little sad to see that. Um, I guess my big question is how much of it ends up being the same game versus something different. That's well, a great question. Like, for me, like in its core, I, I actually like the concept of Overwatch and what's going on with with the play style, especially mm -hmm. with like quick play. Like it's a blast to get in there. I, I don't do it as often as I should, but it all feels really good. So why change something that's already fantastic? There might be, uh, to be fair, there might be actual engine requirements. There sometimes is like they actually need to do enough of a substantial update that it is essentially a brand new release. Like, from the sounds of it, this is why you don't like tend to see maps import a lot. Like, to give frame of reference with another game series, uh, the Star Wars Battlefront games, one of the big questions was why didn't they just import the maps from Battlefront 2015 into Battlefront 2017? Okay. The reason why being, just in those two years, they changed enough about how the engine works and how the level editor works that they would essentially have had to have redone 75% of the work they did before 
to get all those maps working brand new. That's why we only saw like two maps be imported over because those were the two experiments to see if they could make it work. And it was really hard. And they've tried, they've actually tried several times to make PvE content for the current Overwatch game, but it actually suffers from the issues that, from the sounds of it, they're trying to address, most of which tend to grind down to it's not Battleborn. A lot of the PvE content they had for, battle, for the current Overwatch game was very brief, not super flexible, and tended to lean more towards the repetitive side, whereas unlocking character abilities, potentially varied character abilities, and different items and such over the course of a mission, that's wholly brand new gameplay features that they have not programmed into the current game. So a lot of that is just completely brand new content. So I'm not shocked to hear that it's going to be a second game, especially also because think about it this way it's the first shooter to really position itself almost like a fighting game because it really is the cast of characters and everything else and i have no doubt that overwatch mm. 2 is going to have a completely altered lineup in certain regards characters are not just going to get a visual update i'm expecting certain characters are not going to return and others are going to return but they're going to be drastically different like if they ever wanted to rebuild torb or someone else and go completely whole hog different versus their botched attempts at like trying to race to do Mercy and Symmetra in the current Overwatch meta, this is the time to do it. This is the time where they actually have the excuse to rejigger as much as they want. Whereas if they updated the current game, they'd be throwing off tons of metas, they'd be trying to account for years upon years old design. It, it would be a cluster frick. <laughs> hmm. If that makes sense. I to a degree. I, I suspect part of the part of the reason is uh just the dy dynamics of the game uh required a second a second title and probably re re reworks to the engine uh just because Overwatch is the leftover remnants of Project Titan and whatever that oh, was yeah. supposed to be right and there's probably limitations within that engine that re restricted it to being just the PVP or the pseudo PVE uh event that they would do every may and that was all the game could do not only that but just i mean just look at the pve events that they had most of the time it was them just coming up with really creative ways to hide that they were just using bots and oh yeah every character you fought was just a reskin class of someone else yeah i mean e i mean even the one where you were playing as black watch the most unique character was what if we put tracer and one other character together and called that a special unit. So, like, yeah, they need to actually put dedicated time into making just PvE content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, I mean... Yeah, I, I supp suppose that we'll have to wait and see what comes out of BlizzCon. I think the PvE aspect is going to be the biggest thing out of this second edition now. Um, some of the imagery includes, like I said, uh, there's a logo, there, was a, there is an image of Tracer with some abilities, I think I saw an image with Lucio. So those are a couple characters in particular that I saw come up. Uh, so we can expect it. Um, mm -hmm. And we expect some of our, our favorites to be back. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised it was, was that one before some other games, though. Of course, it could be the other thing where they have that intent, but we actually won't see Overwatch 2 again until the year 2026. Because that's yeah. you know standard it, Blizzard tables. It is a leak after all, and <laughs> you know it. I mean, it, it's to the point where something has to be going on because they're having conversations with ESPN about it. Mm -hmm. But it's also worth noting that ESPN wants to you know invest in Overwatch League, and right. mm -hmm. I wonder. Well, sure. It's how it's, much development time would be spent with ESPN, even in just the creation of it. I have to imagine it's in a further spot. Maybe, and maybe ESPN, because uh, I mean, ultimately, ESPN has the ultimate powerhouse behind it. Disney. Also, there's something to be said, and I really would love if uh -huh. Blizzard did this um, with the, with the releasing Overwatch Two. I think if they really want to be clever about this. One should be focused way more on the casual crowd, and one should be way more focused on the competitive, because that is part of the problem with what happened with Overwatch 1, with all the balances that got us to the point where there's now, like, 
nearly 20 characters who are just listed as damage instead of defense or attack or all these different things that because the game used to have a lot more complexity in how the class has worked and everything and it's been polished off to the point that it's been sanded off it's become too smooth mm -hmm. and there's a lot less texture and character to it so if this overwatch 2 is aiming to appeal to people who like single player and cooperative great then let's have this one actually be for people who also just want to play the game for fun rather than who are going to insist that every character be redesigned so that the dps mains are happy well that's fair i suppose uh i uh, i suspect that we're going to see a lot more going into the the esports side of it especially if espn is involved and I, know. I mean there's 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 overwatch league and all the teams and everything involved with that i th i think we're going to see a lot more of the esports side of it um Sorry. Sorry. and maybe the pve side and the story content is the answer for those that are more casual because i, I mean, will yeah i mean I'll, I'll say it's it's got me some hope and elijah if there's any console for this this new game coming out i mean it actually makes sense now i think you have a good argument for why they would be interested in rebuilding it from scratch versus just building onto the game that are is already out there um but it's not like it couldn't necessarily take care of the bigger issue at play as a matter of PvE versus PvP anyways, or, or casual versus hardcore. Maybe that's their answer, is to say, well, those people who are playing more casually will enjoy the PvE so much that it won't be something that you see as much in competitive play, and mm -hmm. lower balance won't matter. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are a lot of different ways that they can go about it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just hate the idea that a game that was literally sold on individuality between all the characters is has been risking a lot of that away. That is my concern, and my concern for the franchise as a whole is, like, there was a point in time where it was truly a game that there were whole new people who never played shooters got into it because suddenly they had a chance. That was a big deal, and... I hope they recognize that that's part of why it had such a huge reception at launch and why so many people were sticking with it for so long. Because mm -hmm. if they can recapture that, if they can recapture that breadth of different ways for things to work, not only does that work out for getting a wider audience, but it also gives you more reasons and ways to play. That was part of what made Overwatch so spectacular was... If you didn't feel like obsessing about your aim, there were characters that you could play as for that. Or if you didn't want to worry about damage, you didn't have to worry about that. And that's something that, honestly, other games have been doing better at recently. So I really hope Blizzard gets more on the ball with that. But I know that their focus is very much going to be on the esports leagues. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Do we have any other comment about Overwatch 2? The silence, I'm going to take us a no. Uh, I can't wait to see more. I, yeah, I will. We'll find out soon. BlizzCon is around the corner and they will be announcing it there, uh, despite the leak that came out this last week. Uh, I think this is actually where I'd like us to go ahead and take a break. This is your, is your chance to get up, stretch, and move around. Uh, don't go too far though. When we get back, we will continue our discussion on what other news things we found. So, uh, yeah, everyone, we will see you all after the break. And it went to the bot. <laughs> uh huh. So that's one way to get out to. Well, bots are people too. At least that's what Twitter thinks. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> wow. Shots fired. Wow. Everyone, welcome back to the Noobcast podcast. Thank you for hanging in there. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Uh, we still got some stuff to talk about tonight, though. We got a couple things to talk about, right? Still? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We do. We do. Definitely. And, uh, Gina, I'm looking at you. Oh, well, I was going to say, you know, one of the things that we could talk about what it's like to have a, a $100 annual subscription for for something for a product that uh, um yeah uh, 
Yeah. So if you guys have not heard, Bethesda decided that they are going to drop a subscription service available for Fallout 76. It is $13 a month or $100 a year. And it includes private services, some additional services, and it doesn't work. I mean, that's issues. the best way to, uh, <laughs> to give people a product. Yep. It's just to not do so. I mean, this has been kind of the story about Fallout 76, though, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It really has. It's a blunder that keeps on blundering. It's, uh, it's crazy because one of the big things that they were trying to do with the game is it was supposed to be try to the game was supposed to be financed off the microtransactions of the game, right? But the cost of items in the game were just so ridiculous that it was hard to do that. So a model that came out was a subscription model, and now with that, there are issues. There are issues. Uh, storage uh, uh, storage chests are having issues where it'll delete stuff that goes into it. Private servers aren't really necessarily that bright, uh, uh, private uh, because it's using AWS. Uh, there's times where you can, you can get instanced into another or a previously used instance, so it's already all looted out and gutted and such, uh, among some other problems. And of course, Bethesda being Bethesda, they're like, oh, no, no, this, the, there aren't any problems. And then a few days later, they realize, oh, oh, problems. They're are problems i i i don't understand right i don't understand how this game continues to have the problems that it has i mean we're talking about this game a year after it's come out because more problems what yeah oh no no go for elijah Sorry, uh, Discord decided to mute me. Um, I think what needs to be said here is that everybody being stunned about this, for me, it's like, this has been my experience with Bethesda for a while now. I mean, just think back to how Skyrim was handled on the PS3. It was up until around the time Legendary Edition was finally going to come out, they decided that, you know, maybe our game shouldn't freeze when people step into water. So, you know, it's just sort of like, yeah, this this is the Bethesda model. That they will just slowly inch towards the finish line, and whenever it's fake, they're going to be like, see? It's all okay. Everything's good. There was never a problem whatsoever. Everything was fine, and everyone clearly enjoyed it. By the way, pre-order Starfield. I expect that to be their response to all this whenever they finally fix all the issues. And the sad thing is... I still, there are people who've explained to me why they like Fallout 76, and I feel so bad for them because there is apparently something to be found there, sure. but it was not advertised as what is actually to be found there, and oh my gosh, this subscription model is bonkers, because like, I mean, I didn't think I'd ever say this, but they should have looked to EA. They really should have looked to EA for how to handle this, Oof. because... When EA launched the Origin Access and Origin Premiere thing, Premiere didn't come for like a solid year. They 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 like they introduced a very cheap subscription model. That's the thing. Bethesda wants a hundred dollars a year or thirteen dollars a month for one game. Mm -hmm. EA offers you like close to a hundred games, and it's like I don't know. $30 a year, and if you want the brand new stuff to be coming out, then you pay extra, but realistically speaking, if you just, if there's just like one EA game that you wanted to play that's going to be available via Premiere, you just have to drop $15 one month, and then you have a solid month with the game that you wanted. That's what I'm going to be doing with Jedi Fallen Order. I'm going to be playing Jedi Fallen Order, the stupid frou-frou crap up on top of the main game, and I'm going to be paying less than someone at retail. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really reasonable value for what event essentially equates to a digital rental. Whereas mm -hmm. Bethesda's just like, well, everything we've half tried hasn't worked, so let's ask for more money. I haven't seen this kind of methodology outside of really poorly run art groups mm -hmm. that have like five people working them and none of them actually understand how money works. This is a multi-million dollar company 
And the best strategy they could come up with is this. At this point, if I were them, I would do what Bethesda normally does, cut my losses, let the modders have at it, and then just let them fix the game. At some point, like three years from now, there'll be a Fallout 78 or whatever the modders call it, and it'll be amazing. It'll work properly. It'll have what everybody wants. So at this, <laughs> it's just at the rate they're going, I'm expecting a multiplayer mod for Fallout 4 to have more features. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so yeah, just to recap, just uh, to put it out there, uh, uh, this is based on the report from Game Informer, is that uh, Fallout 76 will give access to private worlds, unlimited storage for crafting components in a brand new scrap box, which by the way, that's what I was talking about that was broken, and $1,650 of atoms and more. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is unlimited in just how much of your inventory it will eat. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see the value in it. And the thing is, is that you hear the private worlds like, oh, private servers. Most people, when you think of private servers, you think about like that box that's in, underneath the table that actually is your server computer, and you can control things on there, which includes the mods that you want to be able to control on there. But no, 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 no. Because it's all on AWS and still on their their uh, online platform service, no mods, nope, none, zero, zilch, none. Yeah, not no having mods, control no over it. And and here's the thing for me, you have so many games that are out there that you pay subscriptions for, or you can't pay subscriptions for that have significantly oh, more content yeah. and have material that's coming in constantly. And that's what legitimizes paying that monthly cost, sure. right? Yeah. Oh, hell, look, there's World of Warcraft or uh, Final Fantasy XIV. Those two immediately come to mind, and it's a lot more out of that. those two games. And again, uh, I think based on the kind of what was said before, yeah, there is a value to what 76 is supposed to have and why people would want to play it. It's just to the the gamer and mass it doesn't exist no it just doesn't and the problem is even those that are actually enjoying the game it's not like they're get focusing on them giving them what they want it's been mm -hmm. very haphazard and they're mostly trying to appeal to an audience who's already left this is actually an issue i've noticed with some games when it comes to the post-launch cleanup where they're trying to get their act together it's not that they alter course and you know pivot towards the audience that they do have they instead waste their time with an audience who's already moved on like mm -hmm. they introduced factions and P npcs in that uh, fallout 76 but at this point i think whoever is around clearly didn't care that much about that feature or, or that content or if they do there's other things they found that still kept them around that you're not supporting at this point, they really need to look at what their players are actually doing. They need to look at the real metrics and what critiques are going out there because if you're getting people to still play it, figure out why they're playing it instead of putting together a thousand rocks and hoping that one of those rocks is going to suddenly turn into gold when it's clearly coal. They're I mean, masochists. So I will take a slightly different perspective to this. A lot of people who are, are leaving are leaving for certain reasons. Mm -hmm. And some mm -hmm. of those people are probably feeling it, but haven't left yet. And so I think that there is good argument to be made that, hey, you know, let's, let's bolster the things that we know are causing major issues oh, yeah. um, for, for that group of people. It's, it's kind of the, uh, the survivor's bias um, on, like, planes in World War II. All of these planes come in and they have uh, bullet points in all of these different areas in there. And an engineer goes in and says, well, gosh, we better make sure that our, the next time we make a plane that we armor up those areas that have all of the bullet holes in them. And it's not that at all. They should be putting armor in the places where there aren't bullet holes because clearly the moment that there's a bullet hole in there, the plane goes down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's how do you focus in on the right thing? And I don't blame them for saying, hey, these people are about to leave because of xyz thing let's try to give them an option for it but at the price point i don't know if that value is going to actually make any sense and ultimately is it going to help get this revenue stream that they're so desperate for yeah maybe i i think there might have been better ways to to go about this i don't it's almost 
the, subs the subscription model, if they were going to do that for this game and offer a premium for it, they should have done it at the launch. I feel like trying to do uh, a subscription model to Fallout 76 now and the things that they're trying to uh, give you options for, wait till this other feature creep that comes in is like, well, you can do that if you sub. And a great example of where this actually happened before, uh, look at the Old Republic, uh, where it was a subscription-based game. It ended up going free-to-play, but then it's like, well, if you want to do that, you actually have to subscribe. Or if you want to do this, you've got to subscribe. And I, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for some of that to occur now in 76. <clears throat> and I, I don't want to... I guess we can sit here and harp on, on this game again. I know we did it a lot last October, too. But uh, I'm I'm just at a loss. I, I honestly I think what it comes down to, what it really comes down to, as far as this decision and the fact that they managed to to this create this new issue out of this game again, I'm left without words. I don't know why we're actually still. That raises the perfectly the thing. I don't understand why we're still even, like, addressing Fallout 76 as a thing. Like, that's a serious question that I feel like no one has seemingly asked is, why are we even keeping this on life support at this point? Because, like, I have seen games come back from the dead or get patched when they're really close to filtering out, but even then, there was still a plan. Like, I talked about Battleborn and how it managed to turn some things around. The thing is, they did that while there was still content going on. Once they realized that there wasn't going to be anything going on further, they did eventually just kind of go, okay, we're done with supporting it from here on out other than keeping the servers online. Fallout 76 has long out past that window. Sure. I don't understand well, what Bethesda is expecting at this point. I couldn't tell. Well, I mean, there is the the small sweetheart that can sneak its way through and actually come back and be something that's praised instead of just completely scorned at. And I think a great example of that is No Man's Sky, right? Because that game was abysmal at launch, right? As far as what was offered in the game versus what was originally uh, advertised at, at its announcement. And people just tore it apart. But since then, with the most recent content patch that came out a couple months ago, Look at how much that game has changed and how well praised and appreciated and played it is now. There's a huge player base for it, and that was literally one that came back from a from a near end and is actually appreciated now and played more than it had. And I think I'm I'm wondering if Bethesda saw that and was just trying to go after that little nougat. But even then, it wasn't a subscription, right? That no, was. It wasn't. It wasn't. A, the the thing is. When No Man's Sky patched itself, it didn't charge people extra. Exactly. It didn't go, you don't need to give more to get, because at this point, you're trying to convince people that the thing that they spent money on is worth it. Mm -hmm. That the thing that they spent money on is something that they should keep playing. Another great example, actually, to bolster on what you're talking about here, is um, what happened with Star Wars Battlefront. Battlefront continues to have more and more content updates. Mm -hmm. They just add more to the cooperative mode. Uh, no yeah. one is paying anything extra for that. Uh, that Whereas... was uh, Battlefront 2, wasn't it? Because I Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that one's gotten a lot of uh, better publicity lately, too. Whereas that was one that started off in a pretty rough state also. Oh, yeah, it did. And the thing is, it has gotten so much better. It's become such a superior experience at this point that most of the new content has actually overrode the old stuff. Like, most people don't play galactic assault nearly as much as they do capital supremacy because it has just become that much better they fully acknowledge where their weak points were and they focused on what they needed to and it doesn't sound like bethesda ever really did that i mean am i wrong because it seems like every single time i hear about fallout 76 it doesn't seem like anything changed it seems almost entirely like oh well yeah we know that there's issues of some kind but um yeah, it's just a thing that, you know, yeah. Right. They're just happy to move on. Right. I I'm I'm waiting to see the triage that I at this point we're we're watching Bethesda's triage and I'm just waiting for this. I'm wait I I don't know if we'll cover it any more on the show uh, other than unless they really just botch it up. Whoop, that is not what we wanted. Uh unless they really botch it up. Uh <laughs> Because or really fix it. 
I would be totally okay with seeing yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That's true. Uh, if they are able to announce or uh, to fix it and have a player base start coming back to it, I'll absolutely do it. Um, but what's the like? Honestly, what's the likelihood of it? What do you two think? It depends entirely on what it is they actually want out of this game, which unfortunately only seemingly Bethesda actually knows because it's completely in their hands. They have the money to keep it going and keep patching it however they want. And clearly, as RuneScape has shown us, you can screw up left, right, and center with your monetization and people will keep playing your game, but that doesn't mean that the people who are going to stick around are going to be hugely happy and it's not going to generate you tons of positive press. Mm. I also remain pretty skeptical. I mean, give me give me an add-on here later that puts in some more NPCs and puts in some more stuff that caters to me as somebody who's enjoyed the Fallout experience as a PvE content, as a single-player content exclusively. And you know what? You've got my ear again. Like, But it has to be something that is game changing very literally in the sense like it has to make the game significantly different at its core before i think it's going to be worth that time again yeah i'm i i feel like anything that's going to save this game at this point uh is probably going to be in the mod scene but given, given the online nature of the game that's not going to happen so <laughs> yeah I don't I don't see much happening with it to be honest. The scary thing is that supporting mods isn't even actually something that's impossible to multiplayer. Like people have been acting as if it's impossible to do mods with multiplayer, but the thing is, think back to Quake. Think back to even just as recently as Team Fortress. It's doable, it's just the matter of fact that if you want to have as tight a control as possible on everything in your game, then you're going to have an issue with mod creators. Otherwise, you can totally support mods. There's no reason not to, unless you just don't have the resources to make the tools. That's the, like the only excuse. And it's Bethesda. They built their backs on other people's mods. They can bloody well stand to support some mods. You're asking me way too much here. I think. <laughs> I think. Mods. Just want to put that out there. But the mods. The mods. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Christ. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens with it. Uh, speaking of developers and announcements and such, uh, Ubisoft has an announcement as well recently. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but uh, some of the upcoming games that we were expecting from Ubisoft, including Watchdog Legion, uh, Rainbow Six Quarantine, and Gods and Monsters, has been delayed uh, into the latter part of 2020. So we're looking at about a year out. Uh, and it's they've they made it clear that it's not to conf uh, because they're uh, uh, timid by any of the other game announcements that are expected to come out uh, around the time that those games were expected originally. It was to ensure that there was polish and the games were done. I mean, I will never complain about a game being given a, a later launch date if it's going to be polished as a result of it that's what i'm not hoping. once not ever uh, that's what i'm hoping if that is truly what ubisoft is doing and they're making sure the games work and their work work right and everything is there kudos props to you so, we encourage it that's awesome they have the right answer mm -hmm. if they really wanted to put their money where their mouth is i would say do something like on the actual launch day that you had initially released, put out a beta for people who pre-ordered so that they can see what you're doing and what you're working on. Well, see, but you, what you're talking about is you're talking about an actual beta. Yeah. The, yeah, actual beta, not, not the demo that's like, play it before it's out. That you're talking real beta. Or, or even like just making it accessible to uh, content creators such that they can report independently, hey, these are actually the things that they're working on and we 
like we definitely think that this isn't a polished piece or maybe this is a polished piece and i don't know why they're waiting this is ridiculous but enough to give that independent verifiable yes this makes sense and this was the actual reason and that it's not something else i i I'm of two minds of that. Um, the fact that one of the things that's been encouraged by some of us uh, in, in content creation, and I'd, I'd say that as a broad term, regardless of it, if you're a Twitch streamer, YouTube creator, a reporter, whatever, is that these developers need to, if they need more time to delay and use more time so it comes out with a proper launch, I don't want to get what we just got out of this and be like, by the way, I kind of also want this as well. Because it can sound like that we... And I, I'm not opposed to what you're saying as an idea. It's an interesting mm. idea, but it's just the the uh, being afraid of the well, give us this then. What about this now? And this then. And this sounds like we're we're constantly needing something. And I I want to be careful about that approach. Oh yeah, yeah. not just and that. I... Uh, yeah. Not just that, but also you have to be careful because. As much as I would like to think that all of us here are trying to be very reasonable with our content creation, you do get situations where a single content creator can poison the well. I mean, sure. just look at uh, GG Man Lives. He made it out to be, I forget what it was, there was some game where it was actually that he got a labeling wrong and the, and the publisher wanted to be clear that they, um, that they were, that it was a sponsored video and he didn't do due diligence with that. He made it out to be like as if they were trying to censor him. So, oh, it's stuff yeah, like that. yeah, there's stuff like I that where that. it's like that's also why content creators are viewed so skeptically because unfortunately, there are always idiots who will do the idiot thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And as that story developed more, a lot of other people were like, mm, We're siding with the developer on this one, you're just kind of a dummy. Yeah, I, I recall that incident. Uh, yeah. But I, I, mean, I, I get what you're saying, though, right? Uh, I, I, what I would like to think is that hopefully that by having a delay like that, the game doesn't end up in crunch so that when the time does come, right, that there is plenty of time for press coverage uh, going into the game so that it come launch date the new launch date there's a lot of coverage and a lot of um anticipation properly done about the game mm -hmm. I, do, I, do, I don't think that's a bad idea but do you do you want me to be realistic about whether or not that will actually eliminate crunch oh it probably won't but you know it'd be <laughs> nice yeah, no, I, I was following, <laughs> there were developers i was following on twitter who are like if you think that's what's just, just required to stop crunch that, that that's adorable <laughs> So um, it should, at the very least, ensure that the products are done on time. If there's something that someone on the development team has been like, we need to fix this, they will actually have more opportunity to fix that, which I firmly believe must have been the case with Ghost Recon Breakpoint, is there's no way no one on the team went and looked at that and went, yes, this is a perfectly good state for our game to be releasing in. Mm -hmm. So they should be able to avoid situations like that at the very least, which is fantastic news. Fair. That's fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do we have any other thoughts, comments, anything else regarding uh Ubisoft? I I I'm curious about it. I'm I I cannot wait to actually see uh legion in particular so i know that one i'm gonna have to wait a little bit longer for to, to get my what i want out of that so that's the thing uh, i know you can't wait but you can i'm gonna have to point. wait and that's it is what it is right well based on everything that that game is trying to wrap into itself i think that's actually one of the best ones to have delayed mm -hmm. that one is just that is so much, so much procedural generation going on at once. Mm. It's amazing, and f from what I have heard, the development team are getting to play with lots of really cool techniques and everything, but also, oh goodness me, I'm sure all of them are going to need a long nap once they're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. Hibernation, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. Well. So uh, we'll keep an eye on Ubisoft and see what that looks like next summer. I know what you did next summer. <sighs> Going to a theater near you. Uh, 
horrible. Wow. That wow. was horrible. Just so bad. And what, You're welcome. And what you did was work an average of 65 hours a week. And we're sorry. Uh, so let's let's shift gears a little bit. We've got our news covered. Uh, do either of you let's let's open the forum. Do either of you have a topic that we should discuss at length at this point? Um, I'll throw this one out there. Okay. And I really hope that we get the opportunity to catch up with um, some of our development friends because I think they will have very strong perspectives on this. But um, I got recommended the other day to go out and check out um, the Xbox Game Pass mm -hmm. because there are a couple of really good games on there. Someone was describing one in particular that I'm, I'm thinking about for streaming. And oh. hey, you can play it. Your first month's only a dollar. And then after that, if you like it, you can do the monthly subscription. Okay. And that's on PC and on Xbox One as well, to be fair. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't have an Xbox. I've been very, very anti Xbox for a lot of time. And not to say that like Xbox is bad or anything, it's just like they've never been my winner in the competitive market um but this has me interested okay. uh, you've got you play that sitting out there that's been they had a free month trial going on and now they've got their regular subscription option you've got even apple arcade who is trying to take games that aren't going to have additional purchases afterwards and put them into their subscription service for five dollars a month i've been hearing really good things about that one too i have a friend who's just like We've been loving it more than even his other console. Yeah, and uh, Google's looking at making a competitor as well, so it doesn't matter what yep. phone you have. It sounds like you're going to have a good option for it. Yep. Here is my big thought, okay. is especially in the mobile area, and I'll tell you what, let's focus in on mobile this week because I think it makes a lot of sense to discuss them as two separate pieces, mm -hmm. but in the mobile world, we have so many different free-to-play games that have all of these expenses to them afterwards, right? Like, buy X, buy Y, buy Z later, you'll get a little bit further. And Apple Arcade sounds like a great answer to that. Potentially. I mean, that I think that in the mobile platform, maybe that can help eliminate the uh, predatory nature of some of the mobile games that exist. Now, I, I suppose in order to get into, like, Apple Arcade, that game's got to be curated and, and brushed over with a fine-tooth comb, right? Correct. Apple does have a vetting process for it. Um, they have a separate purchasing process for it, mm -hmm. and that means that they have a separate revenue process for it. And yeah, I think that's... That's, that's the rub. Yeah, from what I understand, the way the revenue is worked is going to be that it's going to come down to, with Apple at the very least, I've heard murmurs that it's going to be based on hours played, in which case a short, like, linear, single-player experience is less likely to actually make back its money versus something that's going to get you playing for hundreds of hours. So that is, like, the main caveat for me. It's not that all subscription services are like that. From what I understand, Xbox Game Pass is a lot more like how PlayStation Plus used to be, where they will just get paid a flat amount, and then there's some based on engagement or downloads. Yep. But um, it's going to be interesting seeing how they handle actually paying the developers, because that's going to dramatically influence what titles we see come to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I No, I completely agree with that. Um, because ultimately one of the big things that's going to help drive this is the developers have to get something on the back end too. You know, their, their time is money. They have to earn it. If they don't, then this experiment won't work. But games as a service as a whole, and in this sense of getting games with the monthly subscription, um, I, I don't know. Does this feel a little Gamefly-ish to you guys at all? Not really. Gameplay worked very differently. Gameplay was like OG Netflix, whereas this yes. is, I can download, I understand, with Gameplay, you could have like two titles every so often if you could get past demand. There's no fighting through lines of demand or anything like that. This is, Gameplay is more like, you know, if you were getting a game from your local library, whereas now it's, oh, look at Game Pass. I have half of the things that I have installed on my Xbox One right now are from Game Pass. 
and I can play any of them at any time I want, and it's the full game, and I don't have to go through any sort of other hassle, and in some cases, it's how certain games, they've done the metrics at Xbox, and according to them, more games are actually getting played than they were beforehand. There's Square Enix has been diving in on it, really going full hog, because they finally have people playing Just Cause 4 and Shadow of the Tomb Raider when those two were both basically duds on arrival. So mm -hmm. I feel yeah. it's having a bit of a different impact, whereas Gamefly worked a lot more like, yeah, just like getting a game from your local library. But you had to pay for it. Yeah, I think there's there's good opportunity with it, but it does come down to the payment system. And mm -hmm. of course, Apple in particular, we all know Apple's very, very quiet about how they handle their financials and things like that. We will probably never see anything on that. No. There was a tweet by someone who is in game development that said that Google's uh, system, uh, PlayPass, that definitely will be based off of hours played. And my real concern with it is that all of those other games that are out there that have a lot of the, the free-to-pay or free-to-play aspects um, expect a giant grind out of you so <laughs> that they can give you as many advertisements as possible. Really, they are asking for your time as well. They're doing so in a very different way. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it ends up being the same. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so that's on the mobile side of things. What about like, say, uh, the you were talking about Game Pass before, but now it, catch me up on this because I haven't actually looked into it as much as I should have, so I, I can't speak to it. But Game Pass also works with PC games, does it not? That is correct. There is a separate library of PC games that they have available, totally separate, separate from what they have on the console side. Yeah, okay. there's exclusive titles that are completely now just for PC. To be fair, there's when they can, they do try to allow for some little bits of cross branding here and there, but like it's not even like there's shared saves between them, which is something that everybody keeps clamoring. This is something that should be a basic feature. But even with that aside, they've been trying, and that, that is what I would say is the opera is trying to make sure that the PC side of things is just as worthwhile and you can get the pc side on your own exclusively it's just that in that case you are working with a smaller library than what the xbox has the xbox just inherently has more games available to it right now okay yeah so uh, our feelings on that with uh with say the pc library or the consoles uh, we talked about the mobile platform uh, uh, the like ios and android but what about consoles pc how do we feel about the same type of service being available on those platforms well as i said i really like the origin access system i think that it's been a fantastic boon for making origin be not only worthwhile but it also like game pass has encouraged people to try new games origin mm -hmm. access get, tends to get a lot of games that you see shown and highlighted on steam but there's it's an easier way to actually get into it like um Hell, Vampire is now on Origin Access, just mm. for the basic tier. And that's just $30 a year you have access to all sorts of full-fledged games like that, and that's also the full EA library. That's not honestly a bad argument for them to make in favor of using their platform, because it's not just a few free games like Epic Game Store does. It is a you will get an instantaneous library for half the cost of one brand new title. That's fairly compelling stuff and that's the other thing that you notice that's different from say the bethesda approach versus a lot of the other publishers is that they're aiming low and betting high in terms of engagement and it seems to be paying off for them because xbox as well like they've been doing some really great moves like your first month or your first two months are only a dollar and they also have been doing lots of promotions like the xbox game pass Right now, there's so many cross promotions with different products at a grocery store that, realistically speaking, if I didn't have allergies, I, I could get a few different types of food and I could actually be earning myself weeks of Xbox Game Pass that I could just redeem instantaneously. They are really doing a marvelous job of selling it to people. Hmm. Interesting. Do we think we're going to see more of this happen uh, in the way of games? Because uh, I think I saw with uh, Apple Arcade even some of the games that you'd have you'd have to have arcade in order to actually play those games. Are we yes, see them those games that? are 
are exclusives by and large. Yeah. Are we, do we and think we're going to see more of that? It depends on how the payment system works. Okay. Ultimately, I, I worry about small games, small good games. Um, think about like Untitled Goose Game. That's a super short game and you get all of the material on it. Is it intensely charming and effective in using that time well? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if they're making a percentage off of what they would have made just selling it for a dollar, well, then it's going to defeat the purpose for those. I don't know if it's actually going to resolve the bigger issues that are going on with the, the mobile platform with all of these super grindy games. Um, if it does, I think that there is some real staying power in it. No sure. doubt in my mind on that. Um, but it will really depend on curation and who they can keep on board. And at this point, I I am cautiously optimistic on that. Okay. Yeah, I have to say, uh, above all else, I'm also very curious about what it just means for the middle market for a lot of the double A titles, because that's something we've touched upon several times is how... Yeah double a market has had a resurgence mm -hmm. subscription models could work out for that because just look at netflix a lot of like middle tier sci-fi and fantasy stuff has happened that just you wouldn't see greenlit like um i am mother that's a movie that realistically in the 80s i could have seen being, being made nowadays i can't think of a single film studio that would have greenlit it whereas netflix was just like sure a small spec film that's got like three characters and uh. one of the most central characters is a faceless robot we're seeing games like that now, and I think that's even part of what's going into Microsoft's plan for the next generation, because remember, their plan with next gen is that they've hired on a bunch of studios to make new exclusives, and all of their exclusives not only come out day one on Xbox Game Pass, but if you have Game Pass Ultimate, they give you not only all sorts of extras, like Gears 5 had all sorts of bonus characters, but also, on top of that, they're ensuring that you have early access to their games, getting them out there ahead of everybody else, which is another thing that Origin's also been doing. Now, this idea of giving extra advantage and earlier access to certain titles, which is something that they're having issues with. Like, Gears 5 had tons of matchmaking issues, and we saw how, you know, like, both the first Battlefront reboot game and Mass Effect Andromeda had botched early access periods, but... They're trying to add value in as many ways as possible, and I think that's going to be very crucial going forward. Now, I, I don't know if you realized that you did this or if you did it purposely, but did you realize that you made a rather compelling argument for the type of services like this, uh, especially since how what much is praised, and that is in, in um, Netflix, the Netflix comparison. Because how many great mm -hmm. shows have we seen come out of Netflix and we're just like, well, that's just Netflix. That's what you get with the sub subscription of that service. You're getting TV shows as a service, right? Which you don't think about as often because that's always how TV's kind of worked, right? You pay mm -hmm. a monthly service for cable, you get your TV show, but Netflix has taken it one step further. I can see that, and I'm just generally just trying to think out loud here about all the ways that this could potentially permutate, because, like, the problem state that we could potentially end up being in is if they don't learn anything from what has been going on with all the different TV streaming services now, because everybody's trying to create their own thing, and that is the biggest concern I yep. have, because game publishers are even worse right yep. now than TV networks yep. about this, so, um... You're not wrong. Like... Like, if there becomes a Battle.net subscription thing, my response is basically going to be, that's adorable. That's adorable that you think. Cause I, I fully believe that it has probably passed Bobby Kotick's mind at least five times while drinking the tears of gamers that she <laughs> could totally turn Call of Duty just into a subscription service. And then, then they can just roll out a few map packs every so often. I mean... They kind of tried to do that with Black Ops 4 with the way the mm -hmm. Battle Pass works. They tried to just push it as, what? A, how far can we push our audience to just put down money in blind faith in, turn, in an assurance that they will get content that they want? Mm -hmm. Which didn't work out super well for them, but also, once again, they basically did what Bethesda did. They tried to focus in on a small service. Mm -hmm. Whereas, right now, 
I would say that Xbox and EA are at the prime front, and it's very obvious that they both figured that out together, because remember, EA Access launched initially as an Xbox-exclusive program mm -hmm. because PlayStation passed on it. And ever since, Xbox and EA have not only been working together fairly closely, but both of them have been launching these subscription services that are very complementary and matched together and meshed together all the different ways. Because, like, note how as soon as backwards compatibility came to the Xbox, EA Access suddenly has all these old Xbox and all these Xbox 360 titles that you can now play on it. And vice versa, we're seeing with the Xbox Game Pass, we do see certain sports titles and stuff like that. And from EA, that they really want people to try out, and if they're just trying out their Game Pass, well, then they won't feel nearly as bad about spending on some microtransactions in Ultimate Team. It's very clear that these two are currently in the lead, and it makes me both nervous and curious because they are not being jackasses about it, which is nice, especially stunning in EA's case, and... Really, right now, they are setting the precedent for what else is going forward, and even Sony is finally having to buckle. I mean, just look at how PS Now finally discounted to a reasonable price point after years of being, yeah, we're just going to charge you through the roof for a service that's inconsistent and mostly is just old games that you could just, you know, buy on your PS3. Mm -hmm. It makes me, uh, it makes me worried. <laughs> Makes me a little worried that, that like, there's going to be something that comes up after we're not predicting. Oh, yeah, I completely agree. And that is the big thing, is that we have not seen who is going to bump this over and go even further with everything going on. There is every opportunity for something completely brand new to shake everything up, and we have no idea what that's going to be. No one knows what it's going to be yet, and it's going to be very interesting for whoever does figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until then, I think consumers should certainly enjoy it. Like, take advantage of it, because there's clearly a lot of competition in this emerging field, yep. um, and that usually turns out well for us, at least in the short term. We'll see what happens in the long run, but it's not like, uh, not like we make any calls as to what all of these companies are doing on face to begin with. Right. Put a pin in it. Oh, anything else we want to add to it? Then you should have put a pin in it. Oh, Stop. Put a pin Stop. Stop. It was sitting right there. No. Don't. It was sashaying in do a very that. wide outfit. <laughs> this, is, this is not what we asked for. It might be what we deserve. <laughs> um, yeah, so, hey... I, I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm, I gotta put this out there because I gotta know. Uh, this week is Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that people mm -hmm. like to do for Halloween is play spoopy games. Uh, what are some spoopy games that are classics to you that you enjoy playing? Or are do you expect to be playing this week for Halloween? And uh, mm -hmm. we're gonna kick this one off to Mister Unabridged because I feel like maybe you play a spoopy game or two. <laughs> what the guy who cites about how he plays, you know, Dead Space to relax might possibly play some games that are spooky. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Maybe. 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 Possibly. Okay. Um, well, uh, the game plan is, and uh, this still is down to technical issues potentially cropping up. I'm actually really hoping to do some Blair Witch on the 31st. Mm. Not the new one. The classic trilogy that no one ever talks about that were made by Eternal Reality, the same people who made the Ghostbusters game that just recently got re-released on Switch and everything. Um, it's a really interesting trilogy because the PC trilogy manages to tie Blood Rain into the same universe as Blair Witch, as well as the game Nocturne. They're all into, but back in 2000, some little known developer managed to create a horror multiverse. And it also is like, hey, what if Resident Evil tank controls, but made slightly more intuitive and with mouse aiming? So I'm really curious to give that one a whirl. But, um, an old favorite to play on like the October time, it's something that I would recommend to people. 
Hell, if you haven't tried already and you're not averse to swearing and gore, yes, you can hit the sensor bleep if you want. Uh, Splatterhouse. <laughs> Splatterhouse. I just recently did that one. I'm going to be touching on that one. And, um, like, I mean, you've got Jim Cummings, Winnie the Pooh himself, making jokes about ripping people's heads off, and it's somehow insanely charming and delightful. It is... It should not work nearly as well as it does. So that's one that might actually become something they come back to. Obviously, Dead Space 2 is a good comeback to one. And um, if I can recommend something that you can actually try for free, mm -hmm. um, The Evil Within 2. Try The Evil Within 2. There's a free demo that gives you access to the first three chapters. And okay. I know it's odd to say the second one, but here's the thing. You don't need to have played the first one, and in my firm opinion, it's better to play the first one after having experienced the second one. Okay. Because a lot of the things that they were still ironing out, some of them sadly got patched out when they were making the second one, like the matches and stuff like that doesn't come up again, but the second one is one of the best open-world horror games to date that is not named Alone in the Dark 2008. And yes, I found a way to bring up Alone in the before the new season was even fully underway. I, I love that I didn't even, even have to censor you. The audio just set the clip out right there. And it's like, <laughs> no, you don't actually get to hear what, what it was. Nope, not Alone happening. The there you Alone. go. That wasn't creepy at all. I, yeah, see? Just cutting out again. I love it. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> but um, yes, uh, just really. Keep them going. Uh, what just... other spooky games are you playing? Well, like, what other games are you playing for Halloween this year? Like, what are those games? What are the? You are the master of horror games around here on this show. Um, so why don't you tell well, us? Okay, okay. Well, um, if you have a Wii and you really wish that Super Mario Galaxy was crossed with um, with Quake. Uh, have you ever tried Death Junior: Root of Evil? Where you play as the Grim Reaper's son, your best friend is Pandora, who opened Pandora's box, and like one of the first boss battles is with an action figure turned to the size of a Voltron, and you have to blast him to death. Like seriously, this is a kids' game where the main characters carry around like Tommy guns and wield the the Grim Reaper's scythe. It is I I don't know how this game exists, but I find it endlessly delightful. Um, <laughs> also, I have to recommend for those who liked Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, absolutely check out Exo Zombies. If you can find the season pass on sale, it's worth the $25 for it half off because I got to play as Bruce Campbell jet boosting around fighting zombie John Malkovich, who's chewing the scenery and anyone who is not still standing. It is amazing. Mm. Plus, they actually have the late Bill Paxton on, and he is having a blast, too. You have all three of them in the, those in the room. I mean, yes, John Bernthal and Rose McGowan are also there, but they are just trumped completely. They are just completely blasted aside because you got Bruce Campbell, John Malkovich, and Bill Paxton in one room together. That is just guaranteed to be a good time. There is no game over. No game over, man. It is amazing. And if you want something truly, genuinely scary, scary enough that it even got me, the guy who's really hard to scare games, well, that's simple. Play Darkwood. It's on PS4 now as well as on PC. It's very simple. It's a top-down, isometric game. It's Eastern European. It's creepy as hell. The first night I actually was in the game and hiding out in the, in the house, um, a giant man with a tree for a head broke through the one hole in the wall, chased me outside. I had to shut off my generator so that he wouldn't notice me, and I literally just had to cre crouch in the dark, hoping that no one found me by the generator until morning. So That is some legitimately good spooky stuff. Uh, are you playing any of these for Halloween? That's the other question. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's why I said I'm going to be playing Blair. I'm uh, you are doing Blair Witch, Blair Witch, just Blair Witch. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm hoping to actually be streaming it. I, I really would like to. It's just 
to get those working, they're back when Voodoo graphics card were still a thing, so I have to use a Voodoo graphics emulator to run them smoothly. Yeah, I know. It's a thing that PC gaming wiki's geniuses figured out, and I do mean that seriously. It's I, genius they were able to get it working at all. You know what? All the power to you. If you can figure it out and get that thing to work on Halloween, oh, all the power like, to it'll you. Run for that's me, but the thing is, whenever I transition to like a menu or a cutscene, it's like, and here's some bright flashes. Okay, now we're back to the game. And here's some bright flashes, and now we're back to the game. I'm hoping to soon have a really old laptop converted to a Windows XP machine, then I can just run this stuff easily. Oh, but, God. um... <laughs> well, I mean, oh, as we those... That's a lot of effort. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's... I mean, actually, it, it's not that much. We have a boot disk lying around, and we have no computers currently running an instance of it. It's just a matter of... No one's going to be using the... I mean, understand, this laptop is broken enough. You can't even, like, you know, prop it open. You have to gently set it. It's not actually got the winches anymore. Those had to be removed because they actually broke the casing. So those had to be taken out. So at this point, just leave it fully closed. Plug an HDMI into the Elgato. Boom. Easy. Done. And then I can just remotely play with, you know, like just put a keyboard on top of the darn thing and a mouse next to it. And then, boom. Anything that's super old should run fairly smoothly. So mm. looking forward to doing that at some point. Plus, I mean, okay. your boy here rebuilt two PS3s this year. At this point, it just it's like, oh, this sounds like a fun challenge. <laughs> Pretty impressive. <laughs> smile but, um, and nod. When the smile and nod here. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. DIY is fun, Mish. It's fun. You cannot censor DIY because it's always finding a way. Oh, I, yeah. What I'm curious, yeah. though, is will either of you be playing scary things? Because, like, I know, I know that last year I was able to convince Dizza to play Fear 3. That was an experience in of itself. But uh, I was. really, I'm really wondering if y'all are going to be trying anything spooky <laughs> right now. Because, like, I could keep going on listing things, but I, I want to hear what y'all are playing. <laughs> what about you, Dizza? Dizza? I mean, I, I kind of want to tell a, a little bit of a ghost story mm. for a game Sit that I would back. love to play right now, mm. but I can't. Oh. We're all here. We're all listening. We had had a raid come in a short bit ago too, so there's even more people to come in and listen to your tale of a ghost story. Tell us, please. Back in 2014, there was a game with a demo that was out there just by the name of I think it was PT. Does anybody re remember that? Anyone experienced that? Hmm. Nope. You're in a house, and the house just. Keeps you going through the same hallway time and time again. There are all of these little iterations. I actually hadn't heard of it before the other day. Someone brought it to my attention. And... You never knew about it until... I need to smack someone for net... Oh my goodness! This is like a foundational <laughs> moment of horror gaming and you didn't... Yeah, someone, <laughs> someone out there is getting smacked tonight because... The, the... I mean, in fairness, you never introduced it. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I may encourage you to smell smacking on that. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. You, you, you hear take it? Take that one. Take it. <laughs> there you go. But there are, uh... <laughs> it was a really awesome little demonstration, and as it turns out, it was a demo for what was supposed to be an amazing game. The demo disappears. The game disappears. It's all said and done. The real story to it is that uh, it was going to be run by a very fantastic person by the name of Hideo Kojima, who proceeded to leave said studio. But that is the horror game I wish I could be playing right now. I would love Silent Hills to be the game to play today. But... So for Halloween coming up, are, do you have Halloween plans for stream? What is it then? Um, I will play Darkest Dungeon through now, probably until the end of Halloween. Okay. And I, I absolutely love the game. Its aesthetic is just perfect for this time of year. It's just, it's really enjoyable, and um, 
the scariest things for me are having to make choices where it's literally life and death for your characters and you can completely ruin your playthrough because you decide to take a risk and it goes the wrong way for you. I, I love that. And it's it's scary stuff that you completely control. I think about other games like uh, Five Freddy's, like Dead, Dead by Daylight, um, and while there are scary elements to it, I never feel like I'm... Uh, like, it doesn't seem scary to me because I don't have control of the circumstance or have some level of control to it. Sure. And as such, I'm just not as immersed. Hmm. Interesting. That's, that's, yeah. Oh, I am an idiot. There's one title that everyone needs to check out, although apparently you don't want to play the Switch version, I'm told. Apparently there were some issues with it that they still need to patch out. It has the weirdest name ever, so have your pens out. Remothered Tormented Fathers. How's that for a name? And you might vaguely recall that name because a yeah, sequel just got announced at E3 this year, which really surprised everyone. Um, the best way to describe it is, if you love Clock Tower or you have even heard of Clock Tower, yeah, this is the latest Clock Tower. It's not oh. named Clock Tower, but it is the latest Clock Tower. <laughs> it is a pure run-and-hide sort of game, but you can defend yourself, and oh my gosh, it takes out last lunch and devours it completely in front of it, because it is just so much better executed. <laughs> the story is hokey as shit, but everything else is excellent. It is some of the most visually amazing, like, the, just some of the details are insane, and the sound design, the actual, like, design of the levels incorporating sound spacing all of that is on a level only matched by thief 2 you can tell from an entire other floor where someone is walking in the house that is amazing plus it's actually fairly short so if you don't like long horror experiences you're in for a good time it's like i've been told some people have been able to clear it in under two hours okay so uh, the, the two-part question, good Halloween games to play, and then uh, what do I have coming up on on Halloween this year myself? Uh, yes. So I think my best experience with Halloween game is actually uh, Slender Man. Ah, uh, yeah. Because you remember that? That was, uh, that was probably the first year that Twitch was Twitch. It wasn't just a TV, so I was on my old channel way back when. Uh, and I, I did Slender Man, and uh, I know we don't always look at, at chat for a lot of questions, but there was one about the lighting in games for spoopy games like this, and I think it's worth mentioning because it is a good question and a good point. And that particular one, mm -hmm. which I had the lights off, it was the glow of the monitors and Slender Man, and that is the only game that legitimately scared the piss out of me more than on one occasion because the jump scares were so good and i remember mm -hmm. that and it was good i re i thought that was a great halloween game and even the remake of it and it still can scare you right you can still go you could go back and play it now and the way the game is designed and you're collecting the pages uh of the notes it, it, it will still scare you i think that is a great mm -hmm. halloween game uh because i played other games for halloween before right i've done observer i've done amnesia and I ended up more annoyed than I was scared. There was a moment in Amnesia where you had the invisible monsters that were trying to get you that was kind of anxiety-inducing, but as soon as you saw it, as soon as you saw it, it wasn't scary anymore. It's just, like, really? This? This is what I'm ter- Really? I, I think a good psychological horror would do a lot further in, in Halloween in general. I think maybe... Um, I don't know what night it would be. Maybe like Wednesday night, do even something like Dead by Daylight instead. Uh, Halloween night itself, uh, I'm looking at doing uh, Albion roleplay. Um, our cities have an event with Halloween, and because I play a cop in, in civil service, I probably should be there for civil service. But it that's, should be good. It should be fun, though. I think it, the event team has been working really hard on it, so 
And besides, I'm mm. sure there'll be something that could scare you. There's some really creepy characters in City, after all. That is true. So, <laughs> Not scary at all, but I thought of one other thing. Okay. That would be really awesome to play for Halloween. Okay. Do you remember playing Medieval? Yes. Yes, I, I do. I feel like awesome game. Definitely something that you could play with younger kids and be okay with. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> But if you're looking for something that's just a little bit more fun and less turn off the lights and get yourself scared, that would probably be my go-to. Okay. There you go. Mm. That's not a bad Plus, idea. the remake just dropped for Medieval. Did it actually... Uh, is it out already? Yeah, yeah, it's out. And critical reception has been very confusing because basically the complaints from what I've seen have come down to it's Medieval. And it's like, yeah, that's the That's the point. Rant. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like, just freaking come on here, Brent. It's not that hard to put together. Yes, Medieval has an unconventional camera system. Yes, Medieval isn't trying to be God of War. That's the point. It's an all-ages, horror-ish, slash-and-bash-ish game. It was made during the PS1 era. Making yeah. a f- true tribute to that? It's gonna be a little different. Right. Right. Uh... No, that's not a bad idea at all. I think it, games like that in general are probably not a horrible idea. I I, mean, I think um I think going into this particular week we are going to see a lot of uh Dead by Daylight and a lot of um what's the other one? Friday the thirteenth, maybe. Although you know mm-hmm. what be, you know what'd be really good is the because we've talked about VR how many times this episode. Uh what about VR horror? Ooh, oh, oh, there's... Oh, actually, actually someone a, else had the same idea. <laughs> yeah. There, there was um a really good one that Dan has been playing. I'm forgetting... Oh, it's driving me crazy. That I know what the name is. Hidden Object Guru has been playing this one horror game that's essentially Doom VR, mm. but not like the actual Doom VR game. It's actual, true. It's Mutatus something or Exterminatus mm-hmm. something. It's... Uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. It was really, really weird. It makes Remother look like a normal name. But um, absolutely look for Doom VR clone because it is straight up like traditional Doom. You're just facing all sorts of monstrosities and blasting away, and it looks like it's a fantastic time. Okay. It is definitely another reason to get VR, for sure. And I don't have one yet, and I feel like I'm uh, a little weird for not having explored it yet, especially with with a computer that can handle it now. But horror as a, an entire genre on VR sounds phenomenal. That might be the bit that makes the difference for me. Well, and maybe that's something to look back at and consider a headset for. But could you imagine trying to go through a uh, VR? Especially streaming that too on Halloween, that would take it to a whole new level. Because and we had the question about lighting and whatnot. What about just where lighting isn't a factor? What is the atmosphere that the developers intended is all you experience because of the VR headset? I think that mm. might be a true way to go about doing uh, VR horror for Halloween. Um, I'm just kind of looking for some particular games here and nothing's really standing out uh transference you could do uh, alien isolation vr which is an option uh you have to have some mods for that but yeah that is a thing resident evil 7 i've heard marvelous things about yes actually, isolation reminds can i throw in one mobile recommendation uh I, of course i have mobile games in general are scary so yes this works <laughs> no. for very different reasons for very different reasons <laughs> Need mark this time. Hold on. Alien, uh, Alien Blackout. Okay, Alien Blackout. I actually had to review this one a while back, and um, uh. actually earlier this year. It is fantastic. It is essentially what if you combined Until Dawn, Lost Vikings, and Five Nights at Freddy's. Okay. You are Amanda Ripley inside a tunnel, trying to guide up to four other people around different parts of the space station to try to escape the alien. And the thing is, any one of them can die. The story will adapt and have new lines based on that. As a result, the actual campaign only takes about 45 minutes if 
you don't have catastrophic failure because you only usually have like eight minutes or less per level to get everyone where you need to go. And also, from what I understand, there's some circumstances some people have gotten themselves in where they have like only one survivor left and then you're like nervously just hunched over the phone going, please don't die, please don't die. You're my last shot at getting through this. But just, it is a dynamic alien horror movie in your hands. Mm -hmm. That is kind of amazing and it's made by the same people who made the thief of thieves game and the detail which were both fairly well received adventure games so like they know what they're doing here clearly it's on a budget but even visually it looks really good which is the one thing i will say is if you're getting it on android you might want to be sure that your system can actually handle it because my tablet i tried to load it up and it's like yeah, I'm going to have to grab this again on iOS because this ain't going to run. This is actually just too intense, which is not something you often hear about a mobile game. So kudos yeah. to them for actually delivering that much. They even got the act voice actress who played Amanda Ripley to come back. So, like, there's even that layer of authenticity. Absolutely worth it if you want a horror game on the go or if you just want a horror game that only costs you, like, five bucks. Okay. There you go. So, I don't know. I I guess uh, I'm 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 waiting to see what some of our streaming friends do over the week with Halloween. I just know that overall, like I said, end up in the city or whatever. Uh, yeah, guys, gals, other pals. I think we've kind of made it to the end of the show. Unless there's anything else we'd like to add here. No, I no? think I think we are good. I hope everybody happy, safe Halloween and. Yeah plays a lot of the games that'll get you spooked and some of the stuff that won't but you enjoy anyways great so before we go uh, i know this is a little bit shorter but with uh, three hosts instead of the usual four it does usually end up being a little bit slower uh before we go we're gonna go around do a quick round table of what we got coming up on our channel uh we'll shout each other out and then uh we'll go on a raid uh during the exit we'll also go through the events of the stream uh with that said mr unabridged gamer why don't you kick off with what do you have coming up on your channel and where can we find you? I have so many different darn things going up this week. I've already posted um, two of the reviews and a new one will be going up later tonight, actually. Um, we're going to be talking about Exo Zombies much more in depth later tonight. And uh, Splatterhouse and a couple other ones, including, I can confirm, at least one Resident Evil title will be getting talked about. So that's very exciting. And yes, hopefully I can get everything working and we're, we get to stream Blair Witch on the 31st. And there's an extra special surprise I'd like to have together then. It's just a matter of timing and everything else. But um, if we can, awesome. Otherwise, you can find me um just everywhere as unabridged gamer and on the escapist as elijah beam and under second look which i am very very excited for what's going to be coming up for the november lineup you can already read all the way i talked about for october touched upon another resident evil title touched upon the bureau x conduct classified doom 3 and how resurrection of evil is way better than doom 3 and also about fear so be sure to give those all a read. See you all uh, find out about all sorts of games, the greatest games you never played, and hopefully you'll be hearing this daft voice talking over Blair Witch the trilogy. Nice, awesome. And in the chat, you'll see a link to his YouTube channel and latest video. Dizzy G, where can we find you? What do you got coming up on your channel? Thank you for asking. I am Dizzy G. You can find me on the internet everywhere as Dizzy G. Mostly on Twitch, though. Between now and Halloween, we will be playing some Darkest Dungeon, as you may have noticed earlier. Um, we have wrapped up Astral Chain, which leaves us for a spot in our usual Tuesday-Thursday slot to do something more heavy-duty. I have heard that Trails of Cold Steel is fantastic, and the third installment just recently launched, so maybe we'll go into that series and explore it a little bit. It's been a while since I've had the PlayStation hooked up to uh, to actually stream, so it should be a little bit of a treat. And of course, for all of those off days, uh, right now at this point, it's probably going to be Slave Aspire all the time if it's not a Tuesday or Thursday. Either way, if you want to check it out, I encourage you to stop on by and um, check things out on Twitch. The notification that you get is probably the best way to know when something is going on. There you go. I will pass things over to you, Mish. 
and for myself uh if you're here now live thank you for being here as always we appreciate you being here and listening to us uh if you're on the youtubes or itunes or soundcloud this was recorded live on twitch.tv slash miss michelle jean michelle's with one l of course that's how i am on instagram twitter and other social medias as well and uh yeah i think that is it for us we'll be back in a couple weeks we do have a guest we'll be talking about some vr fitness and game fitness in general Ooh, who's our guest be waiting for that announcement i can't wait to tell you guys i'm excited for it uh but until then for the unabridged gamer and for Dizzy. My name is Miss Michelle Dean. This has been the Noobcast Podcast. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful night. Do -do 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 -do